The topic, the subject today is the gathering storm. During the 1930s in England, uh, there was a man who saw the gathering storm. Nobody else did. Do you know his name? Winston Churchill, that man who epitomized the English bulldog. And his arch nemesis was Hitler. Did you know that uh, people around the world, in England uh, and America, thought that Hitler was the answer to the prayers of the world? They said the same about Mussolini. Hey, he's got the trains running on time, which was something in Italy. But Hitler met his match in Churchill. Hitler hated Churchill because Churchill would say to the British Parliament, the Germans are building up strength and we'll have to fight them again. You know what Parliament did with Winston Churchill? They scorned him. They tried to throw him out of Parliament. They ostracized him. They mocked him. They said, he's just a foolish, foolish man. He's an extremist. And when Chamberlain came back from meeting the Fuhrer, when he got off the plane, he said in those famous words, there will be peace in our time. Ha, ha, ha. And even the American ambassador to London said, he's a good man, he's our friend. And his son later became the president of the United States. But America and the world stood back and said, the man's a fool. But the world was wrong and Churchill was right. He's described as the man, the greatest man of the 20th century because of his foresight. And when they finally made him prime minister, because they had nobody else and he had timid compromises left. When they made him prime minister, his cabinet said, let's make peace. Because we can't fight the Nazis, they've swept over Europe, we'll have to make an accommodation. And Churchill said, never, never, never. And of course, some of you will remember the speech where he said, we will fight on the beaches and on the landing fields. We will fight in the streets. We will never surrender. He saw with the eye of tremendous insight the gathering storm. He saw it. My topic today is the gathering storm. We are about to enter a tremendous storm and the world is not ready. We're going to go through great waves. We're going to experience fierce winds, blazing lightning and roaring thunder. Are we ready? I want you to come over now to Matthew 16 verses 1 to 3, which is really the theme. Matthew 16, verses 1 down to 3. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know who those folks were? They were the religious leaders, the leaders of the people of God. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say, it'll be fair weather for the sky is red and in the morning today it'll be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. The religious leaders were blind. Just like most of the British parliamentarians and the senators and the congressmen 
in the two great democracies, Britain and America, most of them were blind. The religious leaders had a responsibility to lead the people. But Jesus said, let them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. And if you follow them, you'll both fall into the pit. When I was a boy of 16 in North Queensland, uh, driving a bulldozer to earn my way through Avondale College, and was the best thing that ever happened to me that I was born into what would be called today a poor home where my parents could not pay my fees and they were no scholarships. And I was not expecting the government to give me a discount. What a different world. But about three o'clock every afternoon, as I sat on the seat of this great bulldozer, I love bulldozers, because you can move stuff. I seem to think we need a spiritual bulldozer in the church. I would look out towards the horizon and you would see what appeared to be like a fluorescent tube. You know how it goes? Crackling back and forth. And then I would hear the soft mutters of the coming storm. And then there would be a tremendous storm a tropical storm. It doesn't rain really here. When it rains in Southern California, you know, you get a quarter of an inch and it's an event. The super Doppler radar, we've got it tracked. <laughs> but they had tremendous storms and the storms would come and the lightning would flash and the trees would break in two with the ferocity of the lightning. And after the storm, it was cool and quiet, peaceful. After the storm, if you survive it, there'll be peace in the valley. Now today, I'm going to give you two signs. And I give it to the world church, and I give it to my friends in Australia and I give it to my friends in North America and uh, around the world, including Great Britain, land of hope and glory. Two great signs. The first one is the unholy fire. Come over here to Revelation 13, 11 to 13, and please turn to the texts. This is a Bible reading church. Bring your Bibles to church. Revelation 13, verses 11 to 13. Revelation 13, 11 to 13. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb that represents the gospel. But he spoke like a dragon. He looks like the kingdom of God, but he's the kingdom of the devil. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. Because of these signs, he deceived the world into getting the mark of the beast. This lamb-like beast is a great power that arises in the last days and that has the backing of apostate Christianity. It's a latter-day power, but it is supremely a religious power. This bringing down fire from heaven to earth in the sight of men is an illusion it's an allusion to Elijah the prophet. When Elijah the prophet confronted the priests of Baal, the man of God was used by God in a marvelous way and God poured out fire. Antichrist is going to counterfeit 
the fire. Come over here to Malachi chapter 4, and the world uh, is going to accept it because they don't read their Bibles. Malachi 4 verse 5, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Now listen very carefully. If you've heard me preach, you should understand what this means, the return of the prophet Elijah. Elijah comes back not as a person, but as a great message from God. The return of the prophet Elijah is the return of the spirit and the power and the message of Elijah. Don't have time to prove it to you, but that's true. Now, God is going to have his Elijah message, but it's going to be counterfeited, and it's going to be counterfeited with unholy fire. Elijah, you will remember, lived in a time of national apostasy in God's church called Israel. Come to 1 Kings chapter 18, 16 to 21. Turn to every text. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 16 to 21, please. So, Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Plain preachers will always be called troublers. I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commandments and have followed the Baals. Now summons the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table, heaps and heaps of ministers. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. I want you to know, there was no lack of religion. They had it laid on with ministers and priests and religious ceremonies, but it was not the religion of God. They had forsaken the commandments of God. And the Bible tells us that Elijah comes in the last days to call an apostate church and world back to God and back to the commandments of God. And God poured out his fire upon Elijah as he will do again in these last days. Satan will counterfeit the work. For every truth that God has, Satan has a counterfeit. Instead of the Bible, tradition. Instead of righteousness by faith, righteousness by works. Instead of the Sabbath, the first day Sunday. Instead of baptism, sprinkling. Instead of a high priest in heaven, a high priest in Rome. Instead of confession to God, confession to a priest. So he is the great counterfeiter. Come over here with me to Acts chapter 2 verses 1 down to 3. Acts chapter 2 in the Bible verses 1 down to 3. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Fire came down 
all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now, if you read the story of that original Pentecost, there was fire, there was the strong preaching of the Word of God. There was the preaching of the prophecies and there were tremendous conversions and 3,000 were baptized in that day. All of this is going to be counterfeited. Miracles, signs and uh, wonders. Let me come to my favorite high-tech blackboards. The Bible talks about miracles, and he, he does them. Miracles, signs, tremendous signs, and uh, wonders, and the fire comes down from heaven, and that is the fire of the Holy Spirit. And Satan is going to counterfeit it. Come over here to 2 Thessalonians. And if you don't know your Bible, my friend, you're going to be deceived. I'm telling you today. Come over here to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 and onwards. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verses 9 and uh, onwards. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of of counterfeit, mir counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders and people are going to raise their hands and say hallelujah. And in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. I was reading recently about a great religious meeting. And I'm preaching today from my heart because I believe that some of you sitting here in this congregation are going to be deceived unless you change your ways. I believe this. I have this conviction. And I know somebody said to me, but of course, when you preach, nobody thinks you're talking to them. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. And I'm talking to you. Reading about this religious meeting, all the folks were talking in tongues. And then the preacher up the front said, I feel the power here. They got him a chair. He sat down because the sermon had gone so long. He sat down and he said, I feel the power. It's like electricity and I can feel it flowing through my limbs and coming up my fingers. Famous American preacher, of vast American congregation. And he said, come forward to be touched. If you're a cripple, bring them forward. Bring the sick. And as they came forward, as he touched people, they were knocked down by electricity. And then the vast auditorium was filled with a mighty rushing sound. A huge rushing sound like wind and the preacher shouted out at the top of his voice as the people were falling down under the power. Would you be there? The people, as they were falling down under the power, the preacher shouted at the top of his voice, people, people, it's here, people, it's here. He was right. It is here. The great 
counterfeit to the work of God. People, it's here. Listen. God in the last days is going to have a true awakening. May it come soon. Revelation 18, verses 1 down to 4. Revelation 18, but it's not going to be a superficial thing based upon religious emotionalism. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. This is a mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God. With a mighty voice, he shouted, you know, I've been told over and over again, even by my friends, this is not the age to be doing any shouting. They say, we want pastors who talk like this. I'll read it to you. With a mighty voice, wait, no. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. God spare us. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit and a, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. Verse 4. This is talking about an apostate religious organization. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her. My people, God has his people in apostate churches. Far more in those churches than our churches. And in the last days when the Spirit of God comes and God has miracles and signs and wonders and when God has fire, a vast multitude is going to come out of those apostate churches. And I've got something else to tell you. A great number of people who profess to believe the truth are going to leave the church. They're just going to be sucked down into the vortex of deception and because of lukewarmness, they're going to leave the church. But as they leave the church, a multitude is going to come in and take their places. So God is going to have a mighty movement in the last days. Let me talk to you a little bit about God's message of truth. Now, I've got more to tell you today than I'm going to get through. I'm going to talk about the coming financial collapse. But I want you to come over here, would you please, to Revelation 14, because this identif identifies the true people in the last days. Revelation 14, verse 6 and onwards. Then I saw another angel flying in midair. He had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. The last message, my friend, is a proclamation of not of a new gospel, but the eternal gospel to every nation, tribe, and language, and people. He said in a loud voice, here's this loud preacher again, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Judgment hour. I was talking to Elder Salazar, the secretary of the Southern California Conference, a wonderful man, we were talking about the state of the world and the state of the church Wednesday. He said, what I cannot get out of my mind is that there's a video running all the time. He said, there's a video running of every life and one day it's going to be shown to the universe on big super screens. And people say, I don't want to hear about that. You, whether you want to hear about it or not, it's the truth. There is a judgment day. And God's church has been called to preach the judgment hour. And then it says, worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. 
I do not believe in the idea that life on this planet spontaneously generated. Don't believe that. I don't believe in the idea that over billions of years on this planet, something which was nothing, all of a, uh, not, not all of a sudden, but by tiny little steps, became a human being. Don't believe that. I believe in a God who made us, and because He made us, we are accountable to Him. Amen. You and I ought to believe this, and that's why we're going to face God in the judgment. People say, but that's against the gospel. No, it's not. The only thing that can save you and me in the judgment is not our good works, but the blood of Jesus. But if you don't have any good works, it's because you don't have the blood of Jesus. You get it? We're not good to be saved, but we're saved to be good. We're not good to be saved, but we're saved to be good. I wish that was original. Verse 8, the second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Verse 9, a third angel followed them and said, If anyone worships the beast in his image, Oh no, don't preach that anymore, Brother Carter. And receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, no, Don't preach that anymore. I want to preach what God tells me to preach. Verse 12, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Let me tell you folks something. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, you've got to be filled with the Word. I meet all sorts of folks that say, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, but they're not filled with the Word. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you've got to be filled with the Word. There's something that encourages me in this church, and my old heart sometimes needs a little bit of encouragement. On our Wednesday night, during our Wednesday night Bible study, we've got a bunch, we've got young people starting to come. Because, now their parents may not be coming, but they're coming because they want to be filled with the Word. So the Bible tells me God has got a message, and that message is the Elijah message. Now what about this tongues business? People say, I, I don't understand it. They say, what about, you know, we go along, we've been taken along to churches or big congregations where people say, it's here. And people break out in this babbling that nobody knows about, not, they can't understand. It's an unknown utterance. And it is, my friend, unknown to man and also unknown to God. Come over here to Acts chapter 2, verses 4 and onwards. Acts chapter 2, verses 4 and onwards. Now, I'm not going to give an exegesis of 1 Corinthians 14. We don't have time. Acts chapter 2, but I'll show a little bit of truth here today. On this subject, Acts 2, verses uh, 4 and onwards, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues and languages, as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking, what does it say? In, come on, come on, in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who speak Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. The true gift of tongues is the supernatural ability to preach in a language that you don't normally understand uh, so souls can come to Christ. It wasn't so people would feel good about themselves. It wasn't so people would say like, one of the most famous preachers in North America. I heard him say it. 
He said, I know that a lot of people today are taking drugs and they say, I've got to have it. You know, yesterday afternoon, I went up in my favorite spot in Thousand Oaks, went up in the mountains. And as I was up in the mountains, along came a ranger, beautifully dressed, lovely uniform, packing a big revolver. I said to him, young man, what are you doing up here with that gun? He said, I'm up here because our friends. He didn't call them friends. But the big cartel from down south is growing drugs up in these mountains of Thousand Oaks. I said, you're kidding? It's so beautiful here. He said, no, I'm not kidding you. And he said, that's why I am carrying a gun. Now this man, this great preacher said, he said, I don't take drugs. And, and he said, I don't need it. I've got something better. And he said, it makes me feel wonderful. And he said, I got to have it every day. I can't live without it. And when I get it, he said, it lifts me up. But he said, I got to have it. Did you know here in Southern California where everything goes and nothing goes? Groups get together on beaches in Southern California and they don't say Bible text, they say any word. And they repeat it over and over and over and over again and then they burst out in tongues. They're not even believers. Not even believers. I believe that what is going on today and what is sweeping America and the world uh, is the counterfeit. Come over here to 1 Corinthians 14, 22. I'm amazed that many of our people go along to those churches. I'm amazed because they say, those churches can teach us how to preach the gospel. My friend, they're not even preaching. They're not preaching the true gospel. Not preaching the three angels' messages. 1 Corinthians 14, God has got his people there, but God wants to bring them out. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, look at the text, tongues then are a sign not for believers, but unbelievers. In those great churches, they say they're assigned to believers. I ran a great campaign in the great city of Melbourne in Australia. A bunch of spiritists came to those meetings, dressed in black, and by the grace of God, the Spirit of God so overwhelmed them that they were all baptized on the stage of that great auditorium, the Dallas Brooks. Glory be to God. But I baptized a man who was a bouncer in a nightclub. You know what a bouncer is? Well, if you don't behave yourself, you'll get bounced out. Well, he said, he told me the story. He said, I was tied up in spiritism. And he said, the spirits used to talk through me. This is before he came to the great Dallas Brooks in Melbourne. So he said, I went along to a meeting and they taught me how to speak in tongues. But then he said, they said they'd get me away from spiritism. But he said, as I started to talk in tongues, I'd been afraid before, but I was doubly afraid now. I said, why? He said, the voice that came out in that meeting was the same voice that came out in spiritism. I said, well, it's time for you to ask God to come into your life and take this so-called babbling out of your life. And he was baptized. Glory be to God. God broke the power. Did you know there's going to be a counterfeit second coming? Did you know this? The Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, there is going to be, and we read most of that text. It says the lawless one is going to counterfeit everything that Jesus did, miracles, signs, and wonders. I have a book here that I bought 50 years ago. I recommend it to you. Don't be like the people around you. Read. This book, written by 
a little American lady. The great controversy as the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look for the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness resembling the description of glory that uh, is described by John in the Revelation. The most amazing thing mortal eyes have ever seen. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come. Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts his hands. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of malady. Heals the sick, everything else. And maybe you're going to be down on your knees too. You know why? Because you don't read your Bible. You don't come to Bible study. You've heard it so often, and you know it all. And your heart has got as hard as a rock. So when I preach these things, you say, oh, he's doing all right this morning. What about you? Satan is preparing the world. People don't read as they used to. They put emotions in place of truth, and minds are being destroyed by the lords of Hollywood. Minds are being destroyed by the unbelieving lords of Hollywood who take the name of Jesus in vain every time they have an opportunity. But they won't say it about Muhammad or Buddha. But they blaspheme the name of Jesus over and over and over because they hate him. You're going to support that industry? I wouldn't want to support that industry. Now the coming economic earthquake. Get ready for a shock. Going to put up a little graph here on the blackboard. I want you to see some of these things. America started to get in trouble starting about 1970. She then had a debt of, uh, I think it was 800 million, not a billion. Something terribly has gone wrong because the deficit went along like this for a while and then in the last few years, not just the last one year, the debt has gone up like this and now it is about 14.5 trillion. You know what a trillion is? It's a thousand billion. Now a billion is a thousand million. And a trillion is a thousand billion. Now, I'm going to show you some stuff. This is the federal debt. Look up the top on the left-hand side and you can see it spinning. Have a look at it. At present, 14.143 trillion. 305 million. Look at it. Zooming. Look at it. Look at it changing. Going to leave it there. I want you to think about it. I want you to think about it. It is now out of control. Let me tell you folks something. During the 1960s, the country that was the greatest creditor was the United States of America. Now she is the greatest debtor. Back in the mid-1990s, long time ago now, I preached a sermon on the coming financial collapse. People laughed at me. Ministers criticized me. I received some nasty letters. I did it because of research, because a nation cannot sustain such debt. The United States has the greatest debt 
in the history of the human race. And Congress has got to get together and they've got to lay, raise the debt level so the government officials can go to China and Russia and other countries and beg money. And if Congress will not pass it, then the United States government will close down. You say it can't happen. Hey, <laughs> yes it can. It happened to the Roman Empire, you know. You know, Britain had an empire far bigger than anything America's got. The sun did not sink on the British Empire. That was the birthplace of the Reformation. But the great British nation did something. She fought too many wars and she spent too much money that she didn't own. And she is no longer Great Britain. She's the island that is called England. Come over here to Daniel 12, verses 1 to 4. Daniel 12, 1 to 4. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There'll be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until now. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Now, I'm going to tell some of you folks, tell all you folks something. Back in the 1840s, when the Adventist movement was raised up by God, there were a group of American young people who got together to study their Bibles. They were not old fogies with white hair. This is a later shot when they're getting old. But they were teenagers, basically. Conventional wisdom taught the doctrine of Darwin, the doctrine in the church of inevitable progress, that things would get better and better, and when the world was converted, Christ would come. He'd come to a, a wonderful world. The early Adventists said, no, it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse, and we're going to have a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And then Jesus is going to come. I believe, as a Christian, in fiscal responsibility. I don't believe it is right to spend uh, when I cannot pay my debts. I believe in the land uh, of the pilgrim pride. I believe it. I believe in the America of the pilgrims. I believe in honesty and pay your bills. Not getting much applause here. I believe in honesty and pay your bills and I believe it is a Christian's responsibility to get out of debt. But what has happened, my friend, uh, we seem to be deluded and deceived and uh, a storm is coming. And everybody says, oh, don't worry. It's going to be okay. It'll be okay when Jesus comes. <laughs> Come over here to Romans 13, 7 and 8. Let me give you a text. Romans 13, 7 and 8. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Verse 8, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The King James Version says, Oh, no man anything. That's what the Bible says. But this system is not based upon the Word of God. This is based upon irresponsibility and gluttony.
I believe in a return to American old-fashioned values, hard work. I've had a Latino man building some fences for me. He's one of the best workers I've seen anywhere. Honest, good. I believe in hard work, honesty, truthfulness, self-reliance, independence, and generosity to help the poor. Now, come over here quickly to Ezekiel 7. Over here to Ezekiel chapter 7. Listen up, folks, because you need to hear this. Ezekiel 7 and verse 15. Outside is the sword, inside a plague and famine. Verse 19, they will throw their silver into the streets and their gold will be an unclean thing. Their silver and gold will not be able to save them in the day of the Lord's wrath. They will not satisfy their hunger or fill their stomachs with it. For it made them stumble into sin. They were proud of their beautiful jewelry and so forth. Now, here's an article. I'm going to give it to you. I don't say it's going to happen like this. I don't know exactly how it's going to happen. But I want to read some statements from a commentator. I reference our success and experience with Wall Street's latest crisis because we believe there is an even bigger crisis lurking, something that will shake the very foundation of America. In short, I want to talk about a specific event that will take place in America's very near future, which could actually bring our country and our way of life to a grinding halt. The looming crisis is related to the financial crisis of 2008, but it is infinitely more dangerous, as I'll explain in this letter. As this problem comes to a head, I expect there will be riots in the streets, arrests on an unprecedented scale, martial law enforced by the U.S. military. No one believed me three years ago when I said the world's largest mortgage banker, bankers Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, would soon go bankrupt. No one believed me when I said GM would soon be bankrupt as well. The next phase in this crisis will threaten our very way of life. The savings of millions will be wiped out. This disaster will change your business and your work. It will dramatically affect your savings accounts, investment and retirement. As for me, I'm more certain about this looming crisis than I've been about anything else in my life. You see, I can tell you with 100% certainty that most Americans will not know what to do when commodity prices, things like milk, bread and gasoline soar. They won't know what to do when banks close and their credit cards stop working, or when they're not allowed to buy gold or foreign currencies, or when food stamps fail. In short, our way of life in America is about to change. Even if all U.S. citizens were taxed, 100% of their income, it would still not be enough to balance the federal budget. We'd still have to borrow money just to maintain the status quo. Now, I don't know when this is going to happen. But I do know we are about to enter the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Now you can leave this sermon and rush out just to have a meal and say, oh, wasn't it interesting this morning? Boy, he was in fine fettle. Oh, I enjoyed Pam and Jimmy Rhodes. Pass me the salt. Give me another burger. Listen, folks. The clock is ticking. The pioneers were right. The storm is approaching. And like that boy sitting on the tractor seat, I look out and I can see the lightning flickering and I can listen and I hear the muttering thunder 
And I'm aware that most in the world, in the government, in the church, in the state, do not want to hear a strong message from the Word of God. They don't want a person like Winston Churchill saying, we're about to have a storm that'll wipe everything away. Except one thing. A relationship with Christ that you get through your daily devotions and a prayer life and the serious reading of Scripture. Therefore, I say to you today, on the authority of the Word of God, it is later than you think. Now is the time to seek the Lord while we have opportunity. Amen. Amen. Let us kneel. Our Father, we come on our knees to seek your face. We thank you that in the Holy Scriptures you have given us the signs of the times. And the world is not ready for it. Many in the church are not ready for it. But whether we're ready for it or not, it's going to happen. We pray that you will come into our hearts and help us to change our pattern of living. Help us to change these old habits. And help us to get new habits whereby we will be unable to sleep at night if we have not read your word during that day. Help us to realize today this is not a Hollywood television show. And the last thing I want as your spokesman today is compliments from people coming to me and saying, that was nice, because it's not nice. It is the word of the Lord. Help us to know that while the world will soon be filled with despair, God's people will be filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory because they know that after the storm, there'll be a beautiful peace because Jesus will come. Bless this congregation today. Thank you for the young people who are here today. Take sin out of our hearts. Wash us in the blood of Christ. Reach down from heaven and change the gears. So bless everybody today. But may this sermon never get out of our minds. May we know that the Lord is coming. We worship you, we bless you, we praise you, we thank you, we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.